He was the first African American to get a PhD in philosophy here at Princeton. He went on to write more than 20 books, receive more than 20 honorary degrees, teach at Harvard and Yale, and hold posts at universities from Paris to Addis Ababa. His latest hip hop CD got him named MTV's Artist of the Week, and he's played a futuristic sage in two of the Matrix movies. In a famous spat with the man who was then president of Harvard University, he called Lawrence Summers the Ariel Sharon of higher education. He is one of this country's most controversial and gregarious academics. His name is Cornell West, and he's my guest on this special edition of Fault Lines. Despite his perch in the ivory towers of Princeton and Harvard, Cornell West is anything but aloof. And if his style comes off as a fusion right. to be here. of professor, Brother Bob, Brother Bob, how you doing? performer, All right. how you doing? and preacher, that's because it is. You are so kind to have me. You started your last book. Democracy Matters, with a quote from the famous James Baldwin, which says in part, and I know you know the quote well, but let me read a little bit of it. To be an Afro-American is to be in the situation intolerably exaggerated of all those who have ever found themselves part of a civilization which they could in no wise honorably defend. Now, you quoted that at the height of the Bush years in 2004. What's the state of democracy for African-Americans today? I think in some ways it's the same, it's just we had a tremendous moment of hope, euphoria, sense of possibility with Brother Barack Obama. But I think the uh, euphoria is waning, uh, the glow is now declining, it's fairly clear you still have an empire in, in place and maybe a more friendly empire as opposed to, uh, as, as opposed to an unfriendly empire. But uh, it's still in place and I think very slowly now you're seeing discourses and dialogues in the black community about Barack Obama leaning too much toward the strong and not really supporting the weak. Where so, do you see that specifically? Oh, on, on black radio. On black radio. I was just in Chicago uh, uh, just, just recently, and people were talking very, very intensely about the war, for example, Afghanistan. They're talking about uh, the Wall Street euphoria and the talk about recovery and the end of recession. And yet you go in, not just black communities, this is the issue of class here. It's, it's black, white, red, yellow, working people, poor people, escalating unemployment, escalating underemployment, escalating social misery. So you get the contradiction, well, wait a minute, what's, what's this talk about uh, Wall Street now in good shape, stock market moving up, and yet precious working people still suffering even more intensely now? than they did before. So that the contradictions, I think, are becoming more and more clear. And do, you, I think, do you think there's any potential political fallout for Barack Obama, though? I mean, black people in this country are hardly the light, you know, going to vote in huge numbers for Republicans. Well, it won't be a vote uh, 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 for Republicans. It would be a waning of enthusiasm. You see, Barack Obama is in the White House in part because 97 percent of black people supported him. You know, we tend to want to give him time, mm -hmm. but, but time is running out. You see, time is running out. It's very clear that uh, he's been mesmerized by Wall Street. It's very clear that he's got close ties to the financial oligarchs and the corporate plutocrats who have disproportionate amount of power and influence in shaping the American empire and therefore the world, investment bankers and others are mo being exposed every day now, not just in terms of scandal, but in terms of no accountability, no transparency, $787 billion for investment bankers, poor people, afterthought. And this is true for the economic team. Barack Obama was never um, a left-wing economic force. That's true. Can you really be surprised? Well, I think what happened was among uh, those Sly Stone call everyday people, that he had a sterling democratic rhetoric that reminded them at times of what Martin King and the others were talking about in the 60s. So you end up with a sterling democratic rhetoric on the one hand and technocratic policies 
tied to elite power in which working and poor people are secondary, tertiary, are afterthoughts, as it were. And this contradiction between technocratic policy, democratic rhetoric becomes more and more apparent and more and more manifest. And again, it's also a work in foreign policy. So what is your actual policy desire here? You're talking about, in very broad terms, about huge chasms in the society. And we know that people of color in this country are experiencing disproportionate effects from the economic crisis, much deeper unemployment, and a tremendous loss of wealth from the subprime mortgage crisis Absolutely. before the financial crisis hit. Absolutely. So what do you actually want to see the President and the Congress do in specific terms? You know, I think Brother Paul Krugman hits the nail on the head when he says, look, we need a direct job policy. We need an attempt to engage in full employment along with investment in infrastructure and education. And that's going to take billions of dollars, dollars that look like now will go to Afghanistan more and more. And of course, Iraq was still there. We don't want to overlook Iraq as well. So we're really just talking about a kind of Marshall Plan. This is not revolution that we're calling for. This is just liberal policies regarding working people. Uh, we see it in the health care bill, you know, where the one particular option that connects with poor people and working people, the public option, was negotiable. The deal was made with companies, drug companies, earlier before the debate even began. So again, you can see the degree to which the system tends to be relatively broken in the sense that it tilts toward the strong as opposed to tilting toward the weak. Barack Obama moved into office based on a legacy of grassroots democratic engagement that said the weak, poor, and working people will be at the center. Now, he never was a progressive and certainly not a revolutionary, but he was a liberal. Liberals tilt toward the poor and working class, more so than conservatives. They don't tilt the way they ought, but they tilt more. He has been functioning much more as a neoliberal, but when you look at his economic team and you look at his, uh, his foreign policy team, you see neoliberals in the economic team, neoimperialists in the, in the foreign policy. You, you had a brush with uh, the most powerful of his economic advisors, the head of his economic team, Larry Summers when Summers was the president uh, of Harvard University and you, and you were teaching there. Without getting into all the ugly details of your uh, public and private spat, what did you learn about Summers and the people around Obama from, from that encounter? Well, I think, uh, you know, my dear brother Larry Summers, he has a history of being disrespectful. <laughs> you just called him your dear brother and now you're gonna rip into him. Oh, no, no, I'm just, I, I hate the dean and love the doer. You know, I'm a Christian so that I, I forgive people, even gangsters, you know what I mean? But I keep track of gangster activity. And when it comes to me, I draw the line because I'm a Jesus-loving free black man. And I draw the line. And I will not put up with disrespect or being dishonored, but especially uh, those who are even in, in less privileged positions than I am, you see. So when he talked about the, you know, the famous memo about not worrying about the pollution in third world countries, we could put more pollution there. When he was there at the World Bank. Suffering, suffering from overpopulation. He says, well, he takes credit for it. Well, you see, that's no play thing. See, African peoples are precious peoples, just like Arabs are precious peoples. Asians are precious peoples. Europeans are precious peoples. Jews are precious people. Human beings are precious. I don't care who they are. And because I look at the world through the vantage point of poor people, which is the vantage point of the cross for me as a Christian, and concerned about the blood that flows, then when I look at empires, and I see shadow activities, I see a thousand military branches, I see a ship in every ocean, I see drone attacks that kill innocent people, I see torturing in, 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 in the form of force feeding, and a whole host of other kinds of torture taking place right now, right now, under American auspices, you see. I take that quite seriously. I think so if you, if you track the deeds and condemn the deeds and, but forgive the authors of those deeds, Larry Summers and others on the economic side and the others on the foreign policy side who you've identified as the architects yes. of these deeds, yes. how do you, what mechanism do we hold them accountable? Do you hold them accountable as an American citizen? The electoral system doesn't seem to do it. No, we've got to have, we have to have bodies in motion. We need organizing, we need mobilizing, we need de demonstrations, we need voices to be heard. But the pressure needs to be brought to bear right away. Uh, we have to be critical. I think with well, Obama, first thing, especially as a black man in the White House, he needs to be protected because the right wing, of course, are attacking him viciously and some, some of them want to kill him. He needs to be respected as a human being as president, but most importantly, he needs to be corrected. 
let's talk about some of the other pressures on Obama because we are in an extraordinary moment of political theater in this country. You have the Tea Party movement, you have Obama uh, being accused of leading the country down the road to socialism, uh, equated with Hitler in, in demonstrations, um, and, and a huge amount of ugliness uh, which is surfacing in American life today. How do you understand that? Well, I think given the vicious legacy of white supremacy in the nation, 244 years of ugly slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow and Jane Crow, which was a version of American terrorism, because black people have been dealing with American terrorism for almost 400 years. To have a black man in the White House means you're going to get some white backlash. It's just understandable. In some sense, one is surprised it's not more intense than it is. But it is escalating. It's increasing. The talk radio show here. Brother Rush Limbaugh. You say, well, I call him a brother. Well, he's still a brother, too, but got to keep close contact with that brother because he's dangerous, very dangerous. He's got crypto-fascist elements, you see. But he could change. He could see the light, too, but we don't hold our breath. The important thing is that that white backlash is escalating, reinforcing the kind of polarization on a racial axis because there's racist elements in it. It's not driven by race. Because in the end, it really is a question of them being upset that their corporate elites and others are being exposed in ways that they would never thought they were, would be exposed. Because they would, they, they would tied their project, of course, to the Bush bandwagon. And that bandwagon was about greed at the top, indifference to the poor. But there's, there's a lot of rage in those Tea Party rallies against the giveaway of public money to the banking sector, for instance. Yes. So don't you have a complex mix? Well, there, 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 there are racist forms of populism that are at work. But for the most part, see, with Rush, Brother Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and Brother Bill O'Reilly, these are not populist. So you get some voices that are xenophobic populist, racist populist. Are they racist, those guys, Glenn Beck, Rush Limbaugh? Uh, I, think there's, there, I think there's racist elements in their, in their discourse, you know, very much so. I think, well, let me put it this way, that some of what they say is in effect and consequence undeniably racist. That's different than talking about motivation and intention. Usually when you call somebody a racist, you're talking about they intend to so-and-so. See, because Brother Rush will say, well, Brother Clarence Thomas is my best friend. Yeah, and, and they are good friends, and they have a right to be friends and so forth. But in terms of effect and consequence, it's undeniably racist, yes. There's also um, an appropriation of the language of, of, of racism and of, and of racial analysis. There's almost a reverse phenomenon going on when Glenn Beck accuses Obama of being a racist. What do you make of the appropriation of that? Well, I think part of it is, is that the uh, neoconservatives and neoliberals had adopted the colorblind discourse. So anytime you invoke race, somehow you are racist, mm -hmm. and they view themselves as colorblind. They try to reduce Brother Martin Luther King's claim about the, he wants his daughters to be judged by not the color of their skin, but the content of their character. But Glenn Beck loves to cite that quote. I can imagine, because Martin has been deodorized, sanitized, and sterilized by the right wing and neoliberals to such a degree that his militancy is downplayed. Martin never even used the word colorblind. He wanted us to be love-struck. You see, I'm part of the legacy of Martin King. I don't believe in colorblind. You can't love somebody if you don't know what color they are. You can't love them if you don't know what gender they are. You can't love them if you don't, don't know what their bodies look like. To be love struck is to embrace who they are, which includes embracing the best of their culture and the best of their history and the best of their heritage. But love struck means you're grounded, you're embodied. Colorblind means it's abstract and be manipulated by right wing figures, and they're doing that all the time. And of course, I mean, the funny thing is, is that. Uh, the same folk who were colorblind about Barack when he ran during the campaign. As soon as he won, they talked about his blackness. First black president, first black president. My God, my God, my God, we've made a great breakthrough. Black people now ought, ought to be satisfied. You got a black man in the White House. Oh, I didn't know he was black. I thought you were colorblind. I thought you didn't even know what color he was. You see how hypocritical it is? <laughs> you can see the discrepancy between what they say and what they do. So that in the end, it's not a, it's not a question at all of, uh, of, of, of being colorblind. The question is our humanity. All human beings come in bodies, in cultures, in genders, in civilizations, and we have to be able to embrace, be they Asian, European, Latin American, North American, whatever. Hold that thought. We have to take a break, but we'll be back with more of this conversation with Cornell West on Fault Lines in a moment. We're back on Fault Lines in conversation with Cornell West. 
I read a story in the newspaper this morning which reminded me of you and of your memoir, Living and Loving Out Loud, uh, immediately. There's a 10-year-old boy in an Arkansas public school who is refusing to stand and pledge allegiance to the flag in that great American tradition in schools until all gays and lesbians have equal rights under the law. And I thought of a, of, of a story that you, told, you tell about your childhood, and I wanted to ask you what, how you feel about that little boy in Arkansas today. Well, it reminds me when I was in third grade and refused to salute the flag uh, because my great uncle had been lynched and they had wrapped his body with the U.S. flag as he hung from the tree. So uh, I'm in solidarity with that young brother. I, I think it's a beautiful thing to bear witness to justice and to bear witness to justice out of love. I mean, justice is what love looks like in public and therefore when you are, have a love for gay brothers and lesbian sisters, which we ought to have, you are upset that they're not being treated fairly that you loathe the fact that they're not being treated equally under the law. And the fact that this 10-year-old young brother in Arkansas has that kind of hypersensitivity to a group that so many people tend to trash and demonize, you know, I said, uh, he's, uh, he's spiritually developed in a way that all of us can learn from. He's being accused of a lack of patriotism. And yet the conventional description of patriotism, very much still in play from the Bush era, is, is, is at work in, in U.S. domestic conversations about foreign policy today. Absolutely. The Obama administration talks about a new era of engagement. You spoke in earlier about a friendlier face of, of empire. W yeah. What does that mean? Is that just marketing? Or is there actually a change in for U.S. foreign policy these days? No, I think what you have, you have a limited terrain uh, within the empirical, imperial context. Uh, Neoconservative, neoliberal. And Obama now tilts toward the neoliberal, so that he talks about multilateralism. Okay, that's, that's a wonderful thing, but is it multilateralism that is real and substantive, or is it multilateralism still under U.S. auspices, you see? Same would be true in the Middle East, for example. Okay, now we're going to engage Israel in regard to settlements in ways that we didn't before. Well, you're still silent about Gaza. That's 500 precious Palestinians who were massacred before Obama said a word. Now the whole world knows if those were 500 precious Jewish brothers and sisters, would do Obama have said a word? The next second he heard about it. Now you see, I believe that precious Jewish brothers and sisters and precious Palestinian brothers and sisters have exactly the same value. So I am as outraged when Palestinians are killed as I am when Israelis are killed. And it's just a humanist position, and also a Christian position for me. So where is the righteous indignation? Again, you see the hypocrisy in terms of being fair. Well, you see, that neoliberal option within the imperial context mm -hmm. is one that has a certain kind of rhetoric that's different. But on the ground, we still don't have the kind of execution based on the precious value, sanctity, dignity of each life, no matter who they are, be they in the West Bank, be they in Tel Aviv. It sounds like you're arguing then that when you put a friendlier face on imperialism, it's worse because it convinces some people that there's a change in policy when the spectrum is so narrow. Well, is, it, it, is it worse? It, is it no, more no, honest it, to have a Republican be, in the White House? It can be better because it generates new kind of progressive possibilities by putting certain kind of pressures on it. For example, even the debate about settlements. Okay, if in fact Israel refuses to freeze the settlements, then all of a sudden the hypocrisy of Israel becomes more and more apparent. Is if no pressure were put at all, then that particular kind of moment would not have been manifest. At the, on, on the other hand, if in fact we're, we, we're able to show the degree to which uh, a Palestinian leadership is in disarray and you still got uh, various kinds of uh, anti-Semitic elements being allowed to surface and so on, that also needs to be disclosed and revealed for the bigotry that it is. I do think that neoliberalism is in no way identical with neoconservatism. It's just that they're still within the imperial framework. And as an anti-imperialist and a humanist and a Christian and a leftist, I have to be consistent, even though sometimes it's a very lonely position. You, um, you're also a master of dialogue. And, and you've been in dialogue with the Jewish community as a, one of the leading black voices in the United States in the, in the last decades. When you look at the situation in U.S. policy towards Israel-Palestine at the moment, do you see the limits of dialogue? 
Do you see the limits of this endless talk shop when the reality on the ground is, is you know, so persistently bad? Yeah, it's a good question though, brother. You know, Hamlet says, words, words, words. And unfortunately, when we don't have organized bodies that can bring power and pressure to bear to change status quo in regimes, words oftentimes are all we have. Uh, they really are. There are limits to dialogue, but we still have to pursue dialogue no matter what. In the end, of course, you know, those with the cannons can speak last for the moment. But for those of us who want a change, do not have the power, the potency, the efficacy at the moment to change, all we have are words. All we can do is lift our voices, you know. I come from a blues people. Our anthem is lift every voice. How do we lift the voices of the poor brothers and sisters in Gaza? Not just against the Israeli occupation, which is still quite vicious, but also against Hamas repression, which is ugly. How do we lift the voices of those prophetic Israeli brothers and sisters who are against the deeply conservative Israeli government that is fairly clear in terms of its unwillingness to be concerned about the deplorable plight of Palestinians under occupation. Just to wrap up, it, it strikes me sitting in this uh, kind of history-filled drawing room at Princeton, oh, yeah. you are an Ivy League anti-imperialist. Absolutely. <laughs> You've spent Absolutely. your working life in elite institutions. Why do you stay in these environments, uh, apart from the great salary and other perks? You're right. It's, it's a ruling class institution in the sense that it is in the empire at the very top of the system of higher education. But because it has so many resources and because it has such a rich tradition of being open to different voices since the 60s especially, people like myself, Michael Wood, so many others who play a very important role in terms of anti-imperialist activity, Eduardo Godava, we can go on and on, uh, are able to, uh, uh, to be here. Eddie Glaude, my boss, my young brother who's my boss, he's part of the same tradition of being concerned about critiques of American empire in the name of what? Deep democracy. In the name of what? Substantive freedom and so forth. So that it, it, it's a paradox in a way that, uh, that my own beloved Princeton University would be a place where this kind of anti-imperialist dialogue would take place intensely, unequivocally, sincerely. But keep in mind, I spent a lot of time in prisons, a lot of time on the street, a lot of time in studios with hip-hop artists, a lot of time in temples, synagogues, and churches. So this is just one context among others for me to bear witness, to be faithful until I die, to struggle for poor people. Thank you for sharing this context what with us. Blessing. Thank you so much, my Thank brother. You. Definitely, indeed, indeed. Am I, am I leaning all right? No, the lean is spectacular. <laughs> we, got, we got a little gangster lean.